sectionally that uh, at the end we'll, we'll take up the concept of difference in Hegel and we'll look at Defiance in Derrida and how they are different and what Derrida is doing in terms of living on the borderline of the uh, Hegelian system. He's the only one really that is on the edge of the Hegelian system without the inversions that the Marxists do. He takes speculative philosophy very, very seriously, and he also takes, um, you know, ratiocination very seriously. And I'm going to try to distinguish between those two things because that's working throughout the preface. So let me just put up some terms here tonight. Um, so first of all, the preface is really about the orientation of speculative philosophy. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go forward, and that is in opposition and in movement with ratio summation, right? right? So in some ways, the giving um, measure, giving balance, giving ratio the ratio to, to some phenomena for Hegel is a misnomer of what philosophy is. And he juxtaposes the notion of speculative philosophy on the, on the other side, right? So this is going to be going on throughout the preface and really throughout the work itself. But it, it is articulated in the preface. Okay, the other thing I have in mind, this is on the left side. <laughs> I'll try to work with this as best as I can. The difference in Hegel... Michael, and, just to stop for a second. The ra ratio uh, in nation yeah. would be the mathematical? Mathematical and any kind of attempt to rationalize something. Okay. Right? Any, any way of giving reason back to it, which would also inc include somewhat Kantian reason mm -hmm. in a way. It's a different kind of reason in, in Hegel, and we'll get to that when we get okay. to observing reason. But, you know, we're going to see this at work both in reason, observing reason in the phenomenology, and also instrumental usages of reason, you know, which the Frankfurt right. School takes up, and certainly Heidegger dismantles, but the Frankfurt School is really engaged much more with Hegel than Heidegger is, at least in the, in the um, you know, primary sense, if you will, you okay. know, even though Heidegger engages Hegel sometimes. So, Hegelian difference, we're going to speak to that, but we're going to also then go later in the semester. I'm just giving you these terms now, difference, the A, which is not a concept of difference, and it basically is not a concept. Whereas in Hegel, difference acts as a concept. Whereas difference is a gathering into a sheath, if you will, of multiple variables, right, that cannot be conceptualized. It's a, it's a way of attacking Western metaphysics, telos, um, the end of, the end of uh, history. All of these things. So we're going to talk about this more as much too, in both the way Derrida takes this up, both in the Freudian sense of delayed activity, naturalite, as part of his moment, as well as something that cannot be um, cannot be uh, quote unquote conceptualized, not not a concept, and is really in a way part of the Freudian unconscious, and you could say that. This cannot be, ultimately, it can be premised, predicated for Derrida, but it cannot be conceptualized, the unconscious as such. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this yeah. is interesting when that you begin to think this through, right? Yeah. Whereas for Hegel, <laughs> the concept, you know, we were talking about that, the, patient of the con patience of the concept is crucial, mm -hmm. right, to him, mm -hmm. right? The begriffen. <laughs> The big grief, the concept itself, is very crucial. This grasping by the hands. You weren't here uh, the last two weeks ago. You were. I was here two. You were here two weeks ago, yeah. three weeks ago. You two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, anyway, so I'm going to go back here. I want to do this first. The reading, a kind of reading strategy for the phenomenology. I thought about this in my own notes, my own endeavors with this. Maybe we can look at it this way, it'll open up maybe a, a different way of looking at the phenomenology. So first of all, we can read, and let's, let's just do this abbreviation, phenomenology of spirit, Geist, right, will be our abbreviation, right? Number one, as a novel. Excuse me. Let's think of it that way. My voice carries that much? Oh my God, okay. 
I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> As in all. <laughs> right. Um, so as the Bildung, right? We all we all know this as a Bildung. We talked about that Bildung Roman, right? As a novel or a novel of an initiation, culture formation, image building. Build in German is image, right, etc. But what happens is it really basically records as a novel the central character. Right? which is consciousness. Not, uh, you know, Joaquin uh, Phoenix in, in the role of Joker. But the central, central character here is consciousness. Bewusstsein, yeah? right? And as, and again, I want you to, I want to emphasize this, the science of the experience of consciousness. Okay? So as a novel, right? And it breaks down the novel, if you will. We can break it down into several sub sub chapters. Okay? Again, this is a reading strategy. I'm not really doing quote unquote philosophy of contradiction or philosophy of difference here. This is much more of an overview to give you maybe a, 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 a greater grasp, if you will, or a greater sense of what's going on here. So the sub chapters are sense certainty, right? Perception and understanding. Okay? And these are all, because in their novel, because they're repeatable, they keep repeating each other, and they are on, um, there's some continuity. There's repeatable, repeatable and continuity. And you will see this when you begin to read it. I don't know how far you've looked at the text, but sense certainty, perception, and understanding are the three crucial subsections as we go forward to consciousness in general, then self-consciousness, and then shapes of consciousness. Okay? So we're going to do that. So, um, so then you have, I'm going I'm to have to work on multiple slides here. Um, you have uh, basically basic shapes, again, of knowing, of cognizing, but I like knowing better. I think it's more productive for us to talk about this as absolute knowing and the processes of knowing instead of, instead of, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So, um, so the basic certainty, we have, we have the Stoicism and we have skepticism. Yeah, sorry, I thought I'd just turn this thing off. Um, so Stoicism and skepticism, and uh, which are all the preliminary stages of the unhappy consciousness. And very much like Nietzsche, I want, to want you to recognize this, the unhappy consciousness is ultimately Judaic Christian codes, the Christianity, right? That we've you know, been through, some of us in this room, in the genealogy of morals, right? And the unhappy consciousness are negative examples And again, think of this as like central casting, consciousness as your central actor here going on, right? Which prepare, negative example is sense certainty, and I mentioned over here as a subchapter, and perception are preparations for 
for standing or understanding. And in understanding, the great example is electricity. That's one of his material positions here, electric. So to prepare for the breakthrough, yeah, for preparation for the understanding or the breakthrough into understanding. So I, I, I want to convey, you know, really important here, that this movement that is going on, which is always dynamic, right? Going through this science of the experience of consciousness. This is the central character being recorded, much like a bildung or, or like a novel in process, right? Always in process. Goes through these negative examples, through the stoical and skeptical consciousness of both sense certainty and perception, which leads to a breakthrough in understanding. Okay? These are preparations. So these are all, these are propedeutic sub-chapters, if you will. Much, very much like a novel of initiation, a novel of maturity, if you will, if you want to think of it that way. Very much like the apprenticeship of Wilhelm Meister, in Goethe's case, right, in our own you know, background, I mean, I guess, want to make you holler, man child in the promised land, catcher in the rye for white people, you know, <laughs> et cetera, ruby fruit jungle for, uh, you know, the, the old stuff like that, Rita Mae Brown, you know, it's all part of these kind of movements, right, from the immediacy of sense certainty right. to a perceptual apparatus, right, then ultimately the breakthrough mm -hmm. into understanding, okay? Portrait of the artist. Going, right? Portrait of the artist as a young man, exactly. That's another good one too. But, you know, yes, exactly. So this is, this is all going on. So this is one, one aspect of this. So each, 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 um, each um, uh, stage of consciousness, if you want to think again of this as a dramatic novel, as a, a novel of drama is playing out, each stage develops its own particular, its own universal, and then ultimately the concept. Right? So you have this triad working of particular, universal, and com concept. Okay? So there's a change from stage to stage, and there's actually a relationship to their separate, to separate stages. There's always a relationship going on between the subchapter of sense certainty, perception, and understanding. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. You can ask. So can yeah, yeah, sure. Question. Yeah, sure, of course. So are you saying that, because I know like sense certainty is the sort of the first like stage in itself, right? Well, it's the first sort of subchapter right. in, this, in this construction. But are you saying mm -hmm. that within each chapter these categories repeat themselves? Well, what happens is, yes, you're, you're basically moving along with this process of the off-end movement, right? Uh -huh. Which is basically your suppression, lifting to a higher plane, right. but you're retaining something as you go into spheres. So, but so you, you can go think about these things like each time, in the, as you move through the stage, you go through the same like cycle within each stage. Yes, you're going through each, each okay. cycle within the stage. Right. Because you, I sense that you're there. However, then that has to move to perception, right. then it has to be the understanding of how that immediacy of my sense data was not the reality. Right? Okay, this is, this is kind of what, what, what he's really doing. So think of this as layers as well of consciousness. Very, very sophisticated in, in, in many ways. You know, the, the, the layers are always working. And that's why I just call them sub-chapters, if you will. You know, chapter one, or the overarching chapter, is the science of the experience of consciousness. And consciousness is the major, major uh, uh, so, what you have is you have, a con going back to your question, you have a, uh, a, a continuing, um, if you will, existence of characters. And these sub-chapters, these, these characters, the central character playing out in these sub-chapters, right, continue as movements of conceptual horizons. Okay, so this might give you a, a better sense. So this is moving within what we can call conceptual horizons. Yeah. I'm trying to stick as close as I can to multiple levels of a reading strategy of going to, to, through Hegel, right here. So what you have is two things happening, right? The process 
is dominating over the product, over the production, and also the development over any kind of uh, rectitude. This is always happening in Hegel. Process is always dominating mm -hmm. over product, mm -hmm. over production, right? in a way. So it's a very process. Alfred is not here tonight, I guess the cold is too much, but he <laughs> likes Alfred North Whitehead. Whitehead is very Hegelian. Uh -huh. in many ways. You know, very interesting if you read a book such as Science in the Modern World and particularly Process and Reality. Mm -hmm. It's a nice synthesis, if you will, of both Plato and, uh, and Hegel. An interesting attempt to do that. So, your narrator, again, is from the standpoint of the position of absolute knowledge. Okay, so the narrator here, the character of consciousness, then the narrator, would be absolute, um, absolute um, um, knowledge, from that position, right? From the position of absolute knowledge. So the whole text, if you will, is in this kind of mono narration mm -hmm. from the position of absolute knowledge. I'm trying to make this palpable, that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, instead of, the, you know, ongoing mm -hmm. multiple readings that one would have to do to do it. So it's a narrated monologue and it gives you a blow-by-blow -blow account, if you will, you know, the, the text itself, of consciousness taking place, right? Always taking place, right? In, in, in some kind of, um, uh, um, um, you know, uh, Consciousness taking place in terms of a blow, blow, blow by blow account, mm -hmm. right? I mean, an, uh, obviously narration there. Okay, so within the novel, there's there's also perspectival constants, and this goes back to the preface. Mm -hmm. There's the in itself, the in sick, the mm -hmm. for itself, and this triad is very important, and for consciousness. This is a triad that's always working. The in itself is the essence, right, if you will. It's a, uh, 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 a position of passive self-containment. One could look at this in psychoanalytic language as narcissism, or as a primary narcissism, if you will. You become totally self-contained, right? Then the for itself, which is for consciousness, that, that becomes the positivity, if you will, affirmation of assertion, right? However, in the for itself, it also suffers from blindness of self-interest, another narcissistic formation. So what Hegel is doing here, he has the in itself, which is the spectacle, if you will, or you know, a perspective of, of, uh, of um, passive self-containment. I'm too close now. Yeah. yeah, my nose is right <laughs> in the, my big nose right in the front of All right, good. That may get us some viewers, right? Anyway, <laughs> the nose. <laughs> anyway, the, the, uh, uh, the blow by blow um, account, I mean, again, this in itself, which is a passive self containment, mm -hmm. the for itself was, is a positivity of assertion, right? You're positively asserting something. Uh, but it suffers from the blindness of self-interest, very much like union struggles that I've been witnessing, as well as most of the politics of our day. You know, everything is suffering blindly before itself. What's in it yeah. for me? Yeah. What will be in it for the people? You can read this in a Machiavellian dual perspective, too. Mm -hmm. The in itself is very passive and self-contained, the rule over the people. The, the, the rule, you know, from the perspective of the people is blind because it's all about self-interest, right? And, you know, in this case, we're going to go, and this will be very interesting vis-a-vis -vis Lacan and uh, also Zizek in another way, the reading of Antigone, mm -hmm. because this is where we're getting this, the passage into ethical life. Okay, so I'm anticipating a lot here tonight. I mean, I want to kind of, you know, give this you know, sense of, of, of the journey, mm -hmm. so to speak, okay? So thirdly, the four consciousness itself, so the triad, can I erase this, or is that, yeah. is this yeah. cool? Everybody's got it, you got it, Sean? Yes. Okay. So, I'll put this on the board. 
this triad, this other triad. It's gonna be on the video. What happened? It's on the video. What happened? No, no. no. The notes. The notes are on the video, don't worry. The notes are on the video. You got a record. I was trying to take a picture of it, and that's all. Oh, saying. you want, you don't, you, oh, I'm no, sorry. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can play. tell me, I mean, you know, I'll slow down. <laughs> you know, I need to learn to take it slow. I've been told that many <laughs> no, times. No, no, yeah. Forward consciousness. <laughs> okay. 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 All right, so the perspective hypo constant, constants, right, are the in itself, mm -hmm. the for itself, and for those of you reading Being and Nothingness for the first time, I saw it, you will see this movement of the pusla, pusla, mm -hmm. always going on, right? Very Hegelian. You know, this is in the section called Concrete Relations with Others and Being and Nothingness. Very, very interesting movement here. And in a way, you'll begin to see this in the Master Slave or Lordship and Bondage movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of this happening. So again, the in itself, this passive, Right? Self-containment. Here, a kind of positivity. I hate these things. I'm much better with chalk, but anyway. Of assertion, right? But suffers from blindness. And we will see this in the section on Antigone. We'll begin to see this in the passage to ethical life. And this has been written about again from everybody, from Freud's uh, 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 brother-in-law, one of the uh, Bernays uh, family members who wrote a prize-winning essay on Antigone in the 19th century. Martha's, I think, her, I think it's her brother who wrote it, right, uh, you know, and then of course the propagandist who was his nephew who came to the, the States. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, this is going to be in the passage to Antigone. Again, as I said, you know, the concrete relations with others and being and nothingness. Of course, Kojev's, you know, in guise of an introduction to the introduction to the reading of Hegel, in which we begin to see the master-slave dialectic working itself out. And then thirdly, right, so this suffers from blindness, right, uh, of, uh, of self-interest, the blindness of self-interest. The blindness of self-interest. And then thirdly, in this triad, we have the four consciousness. Right, the four consciousness. Right? Which is both the for itself, and this is the trick in Nagel, if you will, and the in itself. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's seen from the other side. And other side important. Otherness outside. Mm -hmm. Right? Looking back in at this movement. Okay? If mm -hmm. this is understandable to you. I hope it is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, how, seen from the other side, what they contribute to otherness in both cases. This self-containment, if you will, the narcissistic um, you know, personality, if you will, if you want to speak that kind of language, or just primary narcissism. And then, of course, the narcissism, if you will, that suffers from a blindness because of self-interest. A narcissism for itself and a narcissism in itself is one way of looking at it. Yeah? And a mirroring that goes on, in a sense. Or it's part of reflective activity as well as refractive activity. But the real refraction is taking place here for consciousness. The for bewusstsein. Right? This is really what's going on. The for consciousness in general. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is what puts you on the outside to make you be able to see from the other side and to see radical otherness, see what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. right? So reading, reading politics, reading the newspaper morning prayer that he used to call the, the daily newspaper, right? etc. would all be part of this. Right? So in an Antigone we begin to see this from the perspective, right, ultimately of the war that goes on between the state and the family. 
and what resolves. And of course, Hegel takes the side ultimately of the state. We will talk about that when we get to it. But understands the tragedy of the sister and the brother, right, that, that is going on. And this is why it's such a powerful tragedy. To me, it's the founding document of psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. not Oedipus so much. Even though, you know, many Orthodox Freudians would argue it's Oedipus <laughs> because of Freud's dreams and, you know, the way he sets up the complex, etc. It's really the hysterical, you know, woman mm -hmm. that is the founding document and that the, the model for that was Antigone. This is really what he's really doing, yeah, in many ways. So we'll, we'll talk more about this as we get deeper into it, but I hope this helps. This is a triad that's very, very important in the movement. You know, the for itself, the in itself, that movement, sorry, being for others, right? <laughs> being in, in, in itself, right? That kind of sadomasochistic work in some ways, you know, going out. So to go outside of that is to be able to see this dynamic at work, to see the dynamic at work. Very hard to do in a consistent way because we're always in a position, if you will, of the for itself, meeting up with the in itself. We're all, this is who we are, maybe by constituent, you know, constituted uh, movements in our, own, in our own psyches. Anyway, this is again, right, the, uh, the, um, um, the, um, the uh, conceptual horizons, then going on to this triad from perspectival constants, right, et cetera, right? So th this, is, this is one aspect of the phenomenology as a reading strategy, if you will, that novel, right? The second reading strategy, and can I, I mean, do you have this, uh, or please, uh, for, uh, I'll go over here. Then. I got it, I got you got it. it. Are you sure? Sean, yeah, yes, you're good, is. okay. Okay, so the second reading strategy, so novel is one, right? Mm -hmm. The second would be as encyclopedia. Right? And this is a compendium, and Josh knows this because he's reading some of his history of philosophy now. Mm -hmm. But in the phenomenology, even though the, the lectures on the history of philosophy are 1816 in Heidelberg, he'll, he'll, in the phenomenology, he'll have a retrospective alignment of categories. Right? He's not going to say Parmenides said mm -hmm. or Pythagoras said and doing that kind of history. In this book, yeah. Yes, in this, yeah. in this phenomenology. Right, right. Right. Not in the lectures on the history of philosophy. Right. There you go. Yeah. Right? Okay? okay? Yeah. So I want you to be aware of that, okay? So the alignment, <laughs> right? The decisive moments. He's mm -hmm. reading it through, and you know, we talk about a moment, right? He's reading this through decisive moments in which categories are realigned. Right? How do you realign the category of reason? Post French Revolution, post post Nazi Germany. How do you do this? This is what he, he would be thinking about, if you will. How does one realign those categories in the history of Western metaphysics? And as I mentioned in the first class, this is about closure mm -hmm. of Western metaphysics as well. Right? Okay. So we have um, um, it basically is setting the stage for the key arguments in the history of philosophy. So you have the concantation of argumentation.
and the history of philosophy, and when they arrive. So how does an argument shift? How does the concatenation shift in a certain way? Right. So he's doing this as well. So for example, instead of us saying it's Plato, we would think of idealism. We would think of empiricism, vis-a-vis -vis Locke and Hume, etc. We begin to think in terms of decisive moves, right, mm -hmm. in the history of philosophy. So this is again a historical approach, but it's also encyclopedic insofar as its retrospective alignment and realignment. You know, realigning, you know, categories as you go on. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. And you know, he really did think of his work as the encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, of which the phenomenology is a part. Mm -hmm. The logic is a part. Mm -hmm. Right? The history is a part. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's quite a quite a you know impressive you know mind I and mean, it's a, a face ravaged by his times uh, as Adorno said. <laughs> yeah. When did this, yeah, this ahead, book came first or after the, all the other books? Which one did he write first? This well, one? this is part of the Jena period. Okay. So this is 1807. The phenomenology. Mm -hmm. The lectures on the history of philosophy were given at Heidelberg in 1816. The lesser logic is being written, but it's not until much later. Not until and if, 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 you know, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's laying it all until out. Much later. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm doing. I'm doing a kind of mm -hmm. retro prospective reading here mm -hmm. from the phenomenology outward, but also from Hegel's mm -hmm. corpus back into the, okay. to the phenomenology. What about the philosophy of history? Uh, that was also a afterwards, right, where he did the stages, the Oriental, yeah, yeah. where he meant the, the African needs to be didactically instructed. You know, this has been a, a, a major, yeah. thing, major thing in, uh, in critical studies, and so especially in critical race studies, where, um, you know, the black Jacobins, you know, would be elevated, that Hegel was well aware of Toussaint the mature, and uh, was, you know, very much engaged in, that was really the model for the master slave. This is Susan Buck Morris at work in her book Hegel in Haiti. But even before that, there was a lot of criticism of his attitude towards the African. Mm -hmm. He just thought that was a civilization that needed to be didactically instructed. <laughs> that they did not have, quote unquote, the background, which also, you know, it's a, it's a racial construction. There's no question about it, you know, in a way. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 yeah, yeah. So, you know, this is a, you know, speculative philosophy, and it's also so Western speculation, right? Very much so. Yeah. yeah. So go in ahead. his history of philosophy, those lectures, he doesn't trace how some of those African schools influenced all the other... Well, there's a little bit of that, but nothing to the extent that Martin Bernal does in, right. in Black Athena, right. or certainly... Uh, in Stolen Legacy. Right. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on this. I, I think that one, one area that needs to be really worked on, and it has happened to a degree, is not only African philosophy, but also, you know, how one reads the tradition in a counter narrative way, and, yeah. and so how it does. Uh, the problem is, is the Greeks, you know, systematized everything. Right. They built the scientific approach, they built the approach to go through it, the Aristotle right. that you're right. reading, you know, look at this work, topics, rhetoric, yeah. you know, the, the little small part we're reading in Arto's class, the categories is just one aspect yeah. of the organon, right? So this is a massive scientific, you know, quote unquote scientific, in the sense of knowing, yeah. right, system, <laughs> right, that, that's going on. So, but yes, you're, you're right. I mean, to bring that up is a good point. I mean, didactic. I don't think he meant it as, you know, a thing. I think he meant it as this is what the Germans, you know, oh, yeah, saw at this time. No, 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 I'm, I'm just saying, no, I'm just, I'm not trying to defend him. I'm just saying that it's, it wasn't an intentional racial slur. I mean, even Kant, you know, there are people that read these people and say it's white man's philosophy. I think that's right. one of the stupidest approaches to the history <laughs> of philosophy in yeah. some way. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, he had he had this yeah, and stolen legacy, Black Athena are all about Germany's tyranny over Greece, and they forgot you know that there were other schools that were filtering, and I think I mentioned the uh, very funny article. I think I'll see if I have a copy. I think I may have a copy in a file of the um, uh, was Pythagoras Chinese, 
Oh. Nice Frank Swack. That's right. <laughs> right? In, that. in a way, you know, in, in terms of the, the beginning of, uh, you know, the analysis of triangles and that the theorem itself had already been intuited. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe the, the task would be to write the history of the intuitions before this became so dominantly conceptualized. Remember, Hegel is dealing with, again, this patience, which I mean the passion of the concept, constantly. So, so this is the encyclopedia part, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so um, within this, um, you know, we have, um, um, you know, the, like I said, you can look at movements in philosophy, you know, French rationalism, British empiricism, Scottish empiricism, right, et cetera. You begin to look at things this way and look at what those conceptual moments are right? and what becomes dominant. In a way, Foucault, in terms of its discursive regularities, has a Hegelian trace here, in my, my view, even though you know, Foucault kind of says the shadow of Hegel is always over him in the order of discourse. So, so I'm really, really trying to open up here maybe what the Hegelian discourse can be, you know, both as a novel of initiation in the phenomenology, both an encyclopedic approach, right, through these, you know, as I, as I said, retrospective alignment of categories, right, in a way, right? Alignment. Mm -hmm. It's not destruction, like in Heidegger, right. where you're overturning categories constantly. Yeah, so alignment and a realignment. Hmm. So it's interesting in that regard. Okay, thirdly, and I can erase this too, or mm -hmm. it's okay? Okay. So thirdly, we have, uh, after the encyclopedic, we can say what we have is uh, the temporal perspective or the history of ideas. Right as well. Bless you. Yeah. So the same chronic and the diachronic working together in this temporal perspective. So for example, the diachronic, you'll refer to the ancient Eleusian mysteries. ultimately play out, whereas the synchronic becomes the rationality of modern science. So you can look again at ideas and ideation this way through a synchronic and, and, and diachronic fashion. The diachronic we know the ancient Eleusian mysteries who refers to Ceres and Bacchus. You probably saw that section, I don't know exactly what proposition it is, but the Eleusian mysteries. Mm -hmm. You'll go through this as well. That's right. What? Okay. So, um, so then, you know, this is both, both conceptual and historical. both conceptual and historical. The problem with most of the teaching of philosophy, it's only conceptual, you leave out the historical. Mm -hmm. And it happens a lot, right? So the historical and the, and the conceptual are working in this history of ideas approach, right? So, the question of the synchronic to me, and then we have a genealogy, if you will, for, of, um, of symbolic forms. And for those of you interested in this, there are two great books on symbolic form. Ernst Cassirer, who is a, a Kantian, really at base, right, who ended up at the Warburg Institute, Ernst Cassirer, The Philosophy of Symbolic Forms, three volumes. 
taken up in the United States by Suzanne Langer, Philosophy and a New Key, L-A-N-G-E-R, Suzanne Langer, and Henri Fousson, The Life of Forms, Frenchman, it's been translated by his own books, The Life of Forms, which was tremendously influenced on the work of Walter Benjamin, and really behind, if you will, the work of art in the age of technical reproduction, a seminal essay that he's done. What was so, it, that guy's name? His Fousseau, Henri Fousseau. So, the syrup. Right. I'm sorry, what was the name of the last book? Life of Forms. Life. V. Forms. Life of Forms. I think it's been, it's been translated. If you were going to read one, which one would you recommend? All right, I hear you. <laughs> um, you know, I think you'd really like the uh, the Full Salon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very spectacular. It's written in yeah. the thirties. You know, uh, it's very much in top of the surrealist movements, etc. Casera is more of the academic. He's a great writer, but uh, the academic. And as I mentioned too, Casera also has uh, Suzanne Langer. Philosophy in a New Key was kind of the American version. Very intelligent, you know, that work too. But yes, if you're going to read one, The Life of Forms, you know, <laughs> to, to save you some time. Yeah, there's only so much time in the day. So, um, so the, the genealogy of Sidolic Forms, you basically see this happening in the ethical community, in the ethos. You know, you begin to see this. Of course, how Antigone plays into the ethical community, what becomes the ethos. So, so you have this genealogy of a symbolic forms. So the question is, for the synchronic, going back to an earlier layer, does the symbolic, uh, uh, for, does the, does the um, uh, symbolic uh, form, if you will, or the phenomenology itself, go beyond the perceptual field, right? This is, this is a very important thing to ask. Does it go beyond the, the, the synchronic? Does the phenomenology pass beyond the perceptual field? Are we really getting beyond that? Hmm. Yeah, and this is a good question as we go forward. Does it go beyond that and understanding? You know, at least in terms of the synchronic, mm -hmm. right? So we'll talk about that more vis-a-vis -vis abstraction. Okay, so this, this becomes more complicated as we go on. You know, mm -hmm. This is, a, this is a, the level of, uh, of abstraction. So anyway, that's another, another aspect here, right? The genealogy number four, the symbolic forms. And so you have, you know, finally, you know, basically the, uh, the, formal, the formal elements which you see in the preface, going back to the pre preface, is basically formal operation, so the fifth, fifth moment, right? And that's what you're reading in the preface, and in the preface, excuse me, right? So, um, anyway, so in the in the you know the if you if you want to look at this at discursive levels, I'm trying to think this through. Uh, you know the narrative. How do the, the events take place, and how are they divided? But that's in the, the the narrative level. The logical level. How do you enforce the consistency of the argument? So the logic of the forms or the formal operations taking place in the preface. The formal itself is repetitive figures, if you will, you know, uh, repetitive figures that you continually see. We can we talk about that when we get to it. And then, of course, you have a metaphoric discursive level. So now I'm going beyond that of, you know, this novel, encyclopedic, right, history of ideas, genealogy of symbolic forms and formal operations into something called discursive levels, mm -hmm. right? So you have the narrative, right? The narrative level. You have the level of the logical, 
You have the level of the formal, and you have the level of the metaphoric. Okay? And we're going to see metaphoric, one of its great metaphors, on the highway of despair. At night, all the cons are black. You know, these are many of his, his sayings. You begin to see these metaphors, mm -hmm. you know, going on, right? Etc. right? So, anyway, there's always this dramatization, again, of, of consciousness. So anyway, any, any questions so far? I mean, this is really, um, um, you know, I think a, a one good way of approaching the text. I mean, if you look at the structure of the text, this is really leading us up, you know, as, an, as the novel, the history of ideas, the, the, uh, the ideational approach, the um, um, philosophy of uh, or the, the phenomenology of symbolic forms, um, you know, the distinction between the diachronic and the synchronic, we begin to see in a different way um, what's going on all the way up to the section, you know, that begins on, uh, in, in the text uh, called self-consciousness, the truth of self-certainty, right? The truth of self-certainty. And that's where we were talking earlier about the for itself and the in itself. So I'm trying to give you, you know, sketches, if you will. Think of this like a, a painter, you know, if you will. And this is what I'm trying to do is a kind of sketch, right, before we fill in the colors and the other lines of the. So we're we're basically doing, you know, some of the, the strategies of the, the pencil drawing of the phenomenology, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So any any thoughts or questions or any remarks about this? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um. yeah. I'm sorry, I feel yeah, like no I, I, I was wondering if you could um, touch a little more on this uh, synchronic versus diachronic levels um, and how, what you mean like by the Illusion Mysteries, how that... Well, the Illusion Mysteries is Hegel. He uses this as a metaphor okay. in the old, right? That is not science, it's a primitive moment, right? Yeah. So the diachronic, historically, can be the mystificatory, the primitive and these kind of things, right? That eventually develop, but are sublated, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Into, if you will, the synchronic, which becomes the rationality of modern science, which opens up a whole other question right. when we go back to racius and nation sure. versus that of speculative philosophy that was up here earlier, okay. right? Because yeah. he's trying to go always beyond this ratio to nation, right? Yeah, yeah. And in the preface, yeah, his critique yeah. is a is a critique of math, basically, when he's talking about time, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, he's also a critique of math, mathematical. That sort of begins or isn't part of the yes part that talks about math. Yes. Yes. I mean, look, at another level, you always have very to, interesting section. Yes, we're going to go to we'll okay. go to it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to forget. That. <laughs> I have some stuff on the preface too. But I, okay. I wanted to give you this because it gives you, a, I think, a broader sketch, if you will, of the book, right, itself, of the, of, the, of the journey, you know, the long march through the experience of the of consciousness, right, the science of the, of the experience of consciousness, as well as, the, you know, the process of, you know, the con conceptual horizons. You want to think of concepts as horizons. You know, you don't want to think of just have conceptualized something very easily. They become conceptual horizons. So you're seeing, you know, horizon on a horizontal axis, not right. on a vertical axis. Try to think of this too, you know? The concept is, is, is horizontal. Right? Yeah. So we'll, we'll, you know, we can go back. You know, we can go back over this, uh, you know, a little while. So anyway, um, um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully that'll help a little bit. Right? I mean, I know how dense it gets, gets to be, right? Um, um, and again, remember, this is always about process. Mm -hmm. Always about process. Okay? So, we'll, you know, we're going to go to the mathematical. Let me do one other thing, too, because I want to do this vis-a-vis -vis the preface. A couple of little, okay. you know, what I call the march through the preface, too. The seven major propositions. And then maybe next week we can go to the introduction, which will be interesting, or maybe I can highlight a little bit of that tonight as well. But you guys, got, I mean, you, you, this, this is pretty pretty basic. Go, go. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting. All those levels are interesting. Yeah. I think uh, 
for me when I read it, it was mostly at the novel level, level somewhat at the logic level. Right. I understand. So well, it's the logical and the formal and yeah. these levels are, and the narrative are all part of discursive levels. Mm -hmm. So try to distinguish between what I did as drama, right? Mm -hmm. With consciousness playing the central actor, with subcategories of sense certainty, perception and understanding, you know, and how that movement and process is taking place. And then look at this also alongside of that, discursive levels or discursive practices, mm -hmm. which have to do with, you know, uh, narrative, right? Formal, you know, argument. Right? And then, of course, as a critique of all the other philosophy. That's the other level, I think. <laughs> yes, there's always that level going on in terms of argumentation. Right. Yeah. Right. But I mentioned that. You yeah, know, those I mean, are the ones that stuck out to me. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Exactly. Oh, good. Right. Okay, good. And again, I mean, just to emphasize this whole genealogy of symbolic forms, mm -hmm. this section here, um, um, that uh, the Fusalon, if you're going to read one of the three authors, he's probably the most interesting to this group. Right? <laughs> Kassir is a kind of forgotten person, even though he's brilliant. You know, he wrote brilliant books on uh, philosophy of symbolic form, the philosophy of enlightenment. He wrote a good book on Goethe, Rousseau, and Kant. Um, you know, this is a very major thinker, Ernst Kassir. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very major thinker. You know, who actually ended up at the, at the Felix Warburg, not Felix, excuse me, Abbey Warburg Institute, or Warburg Institute in London. Yeah. I mean... Okay, go ahead. I'm uh, yeah. my, my question is, like, uh, he, he has such a good critique of sort of positivistic uh, science and, yes. and thought. Yes. And Hegel was so popular of his own time. How did we get to this place where we only live in this instrumental positivistic uh, thinking only? Like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. You know, a student was Robling who built the Brooklyn Bridge. Really? If you look at the Brooklyn Bridge carefully, it's a very dialectical well, construction. If you to want to that. look at that, you know, yeah. Robling was, the, who did not live to see the completion, the son did it, but Robling asked the master, Where, what do I do now? Should I stay and study here? He says, go to the New World. Really? And built. He built the He told bridge. him to build the bridge. Oh, I didn't know that. So he was a student of uh, Jorg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Huh. Yeah. That's crazy. That's yeah. Cool. So they should have called it the GWF bridge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> George William Friedrich Hegel's bridge. But it really is. I mean, when you really look at it, the, the, the tightness and the formal symmetry hmm. of this bridge is pretty amazing. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, and this is a, a part of the influence of Hegel upon a student. Would you say it's the nicest bridge of all the bridges? Here in New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, I'm going to walk across Yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting, yeah. Yeah, think about it too in terms of triads. Think about it in terms of spheres. Think about it as an engineering marvel that comes down to, you know, kind of, Premises that come out of you know prevailing philosophy. It's interesting. Yeah, awesome. to see it. The wingspan, the spans, and all this the way it's held up. Uh, so he was a student. Yes, he was a student of Hegel. Most people don't know this. I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yes, we'll go. What happened? A lot happened. I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, you had you know the plantation south. Mm -hmm. You had you know enormous amounts of exploitation. This was the last thing liberation. On a lot of people's minds, just mm -hmm. like today, yeah. positivism, you know, static positivism, active positivism. We can look at positivism in many different forms, but this is non-dialectical thinking, mm -hmm. or at least you know, sophisticated dialectical thinking is not operative in the educational institutions yeah. or in the society at large. It's very hard to get that dynamic going. Yeah. People yeah. are either practiced in something and they stay with it, they stay static there, they can't go beyond it, and at the same time we have uh, this kind of you know, completely statistical data approach now. I just read something on history, this new accumulation, I'll send it around, a friend of mine sent it to me from the English Guardian on the new way of doing history through data accumulation. <laughs> Right? And how liberating this will be is, oh, the great. Yeah, is the claim. So, yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question, but really that's what happened, yes, in yes. a way, progress.
Yeah. The notion, the false notion of progress. Yeah, this is another thing. Yeah. But it's not progress in this sense at all, or no, it's not progress at all. Yeah. No, this is process. Yeah. And, and you know, a kind of dy dynamism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taken away. He's the Aristotle. Yeah. I mean, to put it in you know kind of banal terms, but you know, he is the the Aristotle of our age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he really is. You know, two hundred years ago, all the schools. You know. Before Heidegger's working with yeah, Marx, right? John Dewey was a Galian, mm -hmm. went to study Hegel in Germany. Yeah. He considers his work a Galian. Stanley loves Dewey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. And, um, 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 you know, obviously a lot of many Hegelian yeah. interpreters. Zizek is a Galian at a very, you know, at another level. You know, Lacan to a degree. You know, I'm going to give you an article later on. I want you to have at least, you know, some some feeling for Hegel, and then you can read this stuff in a different kind of depth. But yeah, Lacan and Kojet, right? Yes. Yeah. This mixing that goes on. Freud, to my knowledge, did not read Hegel. Was mm -hmm. certainly aware of him. He claimed he didn't read Nietzsche, but he read Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was a big, big time denial. <laughs> Yeah, but this evolves, he's made it finally. He knew it. So anyway, what I what I'd like to attune you to, I'll wait till you come back because I'm gonna put more on the board. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, could you I mean you raise a great point, you know. How do we how do we get to all this uh, positivism almost everywhere? Yeah. It's everywhere. Well, I mean look at what's happened in the universities. I complain about LIU. Yeah. But what basically yeah, LIU no. This is this no, happening no, all yeah, over? Everywhere. Basically, we have at LIU a Bloomberg person, a lawyer that comes out of the Bloomberg moment, right? And he's now hiring all these business types that are 30, 40 years old, the new dean, the new honors director. They all come out of this kind of model of business, bean counting, make, make a profit on it, you know, go out and get research money. You know, you're not there to really educate anybody. You're there as an entrepreneur, right. teacher as entrepreneur, teacher as positivist, teacher as, you know, your job depends on you bringing in money to the university. So really it's just that this isn't conducive to capitalism at all, basically. The Hegel, no, the Hegel, no, this is not a, no, no. no. I mean, really capitalism is. at some levels, I mean, in terms of, you know, a very intelligent capitalism, whatever mm -hmm. that would mean. Right. But I mean, in a sense, Yes, there's a Galian constructions going on in some sure. of these minds. Yeah. You know, I mean, the old thing was that the hedge fund managers like Soros and company were people that came out of the Hegelian moment mm -hmm. because they understood political. You know, Hegel read actively. He yeah. read Ricardo. He read Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. These were contemporaries of his or close enough. Mm -hmm. So he read d deeply in the sciences of his day, mm -hmm. deeply in political economy of his day. Yeah. He wrote a a four volume lectures on aesthetics, mm -hmm. too. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. I've been reading fine um, art. some of Adorno's aesthetic theory. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's like completely Hegelian. Yeah. It's yes. basically just reiterating these and points. Lu yeah, and Luke Arch, too. Four well, Heidelberg things. aesthetics yeah. is very much as, as well. Yeah. Adorno and, and Luke Arch both yeah. take heavily from Hegel in different ways. Yeah. Yes. And Marcuse, the aesthetic dimension, yeah. leaves room for the particular with Artaud. Mm -hmm. and um, uh, Mallarmé, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you know, is still working with the universal aesthetic dimension that he thinks is subverts the dominant consciousness. That's his definition of what art does. Yeah. It's a subversion of dominant consciousness. That's a very Hegelian point. Very yeah. Hegelian, yeah. I mean, Adorno seems to take just the, almost the four consciousness levels seems to be the, you know, the, what the art, artwork Well, is. I mean, the interesting thing about Dorna, the closure is Beckett. Beckett, in terms of the singularity mm -hmm. of experience, especially endgame, mm -hmm. becomes the closure, you know, a new, a new kind of closure, this minimalist, mm -hmm. you know, moment. You know, you've gone from modernism and mm -hmm. high modernism mm -hmm. to almost this minimalist movement, right? Mm -hmm. That no longer is there anything left right. in the end game, right? Yeah, but do you right. really disagree, though, right, on Endgame? Who does? I'm sorry? But you? Yes. On Endgame? Yeah. Yeah, there's a big deal. There's a disagreement with the, with the two of them. Yeah. Yes. 
Did you go last uh, last night? No, I, I couldn't make it. Andrew yeah. went. I think he recorded it. Did they? Oh, good. Okay. Did they? Um, did they get in? They got in. Yeah. They must have gone very early, huh? Uh, yeah, I think he, just he went. I don't know when. Yeah. Okay. Because the gallery is not open at that time. Yeah. I think he went again tonight. Even. Well, there's another one, okay. and both at uh, Bray's uh, and Miguel. Sure okay. 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 okay, okay. The Did time I, I went, there were 350 people outside wow. for 80 seats. He didn't mention anything like that, so okay, I maybe don't know. not. Okay, but I'll, I'll ask maybe he can send. Yeah, it no, it'd be kind of interesting training. to know, you know, because the last time Baju did this years ago and talked, it was like down in the lower east side. Okay. And, uh, uh, there are two. They have two spaces now. Yeah, which the yellow group. What's this now? A Bray. Yeah. One's like the old one that's smaller. There's Very maybe, small. And there's now the a one, bigger one, right? Now right. there's like a bigger one, yeah. yeah. I, was that the one he did? I saw one, uh, he did like the thesis on contemporary art. Yeah, I think yeah. he did that yeah. there. Yeah. That's probably I saw that yeah. one. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where he talked about Picasso. Yeah, like, yeah. He, he handed out Guernica. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, well we'll go back to it again. I think it's an important uh, Play, to put it mildly. Okay, I want to just mention a couple of things about the uh, the uh, the preface. Um, you know, uh, the real issue to me in phenomenology is how to do philosophy. Right? This is where he's really going. He thinks philosophy is not a summation. It is not just an argument. Right, etc. It's really speculative philosophy. It's the perennial activity of the human spirit. Right? This is really what he thinks that philosophy is. It's always inseparable from its content, and it also has its own rhythm of self-determination. So both the rhythm and the inseparability from its content. The content is always there. You cannot just be a formalist with Hegel. Right? It's always a I like that rhythm element. Yes. Yes. So they're Her Heraclitus, basically, right? Exactly. The rhythmos. Right? Yeah. The rhythmos. Right? Which, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you have to, you, the, for, for the philosophy, you're always moving, uh, you know, uh, in the process of, of striving towards philosophy. You're always moving towards rationality, but you never rest in rationality. So this whole question of the real is the rational and the rational is the real, which is one of Tangle's better known propositions that has been, you know, commented upon for a long time. It's still, you're still in movement, you never rest. And this is the old Aristotelian motion and rest uh, uh, problematic. Uh, so there's an insistence always of taking the rigorous efforts of the concept upon oneself. The concept, right? And the concept here is the absolute idea and, and, the, um, and of course the process of, uh, you know, uh, absolute knowing. Okay, so this is very important. I don't think I have to put this on the board. You know, what he wants us to do, I'm going to put up this opposition, I'll put it up again, that he wants us to be doing, if you will, speculative philosophy. An unending activity, right? An unending activity, always moving towards rationality, but never resting there. This is always a ten tension. No room for complacency. So that's and what speculative means. Yes. Always moving towards. Always moving towards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. speculative philosophy, always moving towards. And it is put in opposition to, if you will, ratio summation, ratio summation, right? always in opposition. This is the stuff that instrumental reason is made of it. You have to avoid it. So that's the working premise of doing spe uh, speculative philosophy. Avoid ratio summation. Completely, right? So this is very important. The philosopher must be willing to give up the arbitrariness of his own bright ideas, 
<laughs> so, you know, you have to say, I'm not so smart, right? And give them up in an essential moment to what is called the concept of attention. So you have to essentially relinquish being in control. This is the way of attacking the in itself and the be and the for itself too. Is that is that a quote or did you write that? No, that's me. I wrote okay. this. This is Michael <laughs> Beale. Relinquish being in control. <laughs> Can you say it one more time? Yes, I, I, I'll say again. The, the two major features, if you will, of speculative philosophy, number one is you have to avoid ratiocination, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you have to relinquish to being in control. Mm -hmm. And as a philosopher, you must give up your arbitrariness of your own so-called great ideas that come to you, right? The light bulb went off or something like that. And give them up in an essential moment, if you will, to the concept of attention. Right? So relinquish being in control is crucial. Yeah. Crucial. And that's always our problem. We talk about societies of control from the outside, but our problem is we're always affected by that. We don't want to lose control. Mm -hmm. We're afraid of losing control. We're afraid of the risk. We're afraid of the speculative risk. Yeah, death. This is really, really part of Hegel's th th thing, you know, is that kind of mm. risk taking of, in the thought, mm. in, in thought, right? But thought is also reflecting, you know, something out there. Okay? So, the moment of it, the concept of attention, right, is, you know, really. Th you know, thinking comprehensively. Okay, I want you to, again, understand this, that speculative philosophy also thinks comprehensively. And it's opposed, right, to ratiocination. It's a reflection of the vanity of the I, the empty I, narcissistic thinking, and it relies on an unmediated, you know, um, um, if you will, uh, um, um, how should I say this? Uh, uh, instigation, unmediated instigations and introspection, unmediated. You know, if there's an unmediated moment going on, right? Or an instant, if you will, this may be better put temporally. The unmediated instant that we get. Snapshots, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Snapshots. So, Alla Marcuse and others, Frankfurt School, Dorno, negativity is essential to thought itself. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is, again, where Josh had mentioned earlier about positivism. This is the problem again. You can see this in the note on the dialectic and the new edition of Reason and Revolution in the 60s that Marcuse wrote. We have lost the power of negative thinking. Right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah? Right? And what we've lost is not, not to what is thought itself, right? But, yeah, but the negative as its imminent movement. That's what we're missing. And determination, and as the whole, right, that is in the position, the determinative negative, and therefore yields a positive content. Mm -hmm. Okay? Always leads a positive round. Predicates, going back to where you want to probably go in the preface, preface itself, are always activities. Mm -hmm. Much like Aristotle, too. You know, the predicate is always an activity. So the predicate here, if you will, or the predication in Hegel, is negativity is essential to thought itself. Right? But not to what thought itself is, the negative as its an imminent movement and determination. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So this goes back to Spinoza, the famous saying, omnis determinatio est negatio. All determination is negative. You have a negative determination. Or what could be called in Hegelian terms, the determinant negation. Yeah. Okay? And this is what produces movement.
So this is the beginning, if you will, of an articulation of the labor of the negative. In Hegel, of which Korshev and Matai have many arguments about, which, you know, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, what is the most important word a child learns? And it should be dead? No. Right? The negative. Not yeah. this generation. I, mean, I don't know what this <laughs> But anyway, yeah, I mean, who knows? You know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I see all these affirmations. Today I'm, I'm buying a banana bread, a guy with a poodle, but couldn't be more than 22 years old, comes up and just bumps right in front. You know, it's like they've never been taught any kind of <laughs> spatial <laughs> relations. This was at the, 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 the food, food court across oh, the street okay. from LIU at City Point, <laughs> right? Et cetera. So what I want you to really get here is that the, ne- the power of negative thinking is crucial to Hegel. Mm-hmm. And of course, crucial to Marx, too, because Marx is always working through determined negations in a different way. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question here is, Marx as processional as Hegel? I mean, uh, philosophically, this would be an interesting, you know, uh, conversation, ultimately, you know, philosophically speaking, not in terms of, you know, the categories of, you know, the, Remember, Marx is doing critique of political economy. He's unmasking political economy completely by doing negative thinking. Right? He's making mm-hmm. down the categories. See, I, our problem, and I mean, I've been through this, so I can speak to it, is that we've always been so accustomed to thinking in positive terms, right? We've been so accustomed and trained not to think in this way, to think in the negative way, and therefore we get fooled by so much, right, in the world, and you know, then all of a sudden we happen upon psychoanalysis and its levels of, you know, disavowal denial and the existence of the unconscious. We go up with Hegel and Marx and we begin to see things in a completely different light, you know, and, and this, is, this is important, you know, to, 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 to keep in mind. You know, how much of this is really about positive destruction, mm-hmm. right? Very much like Heidegger does phenomenologically, but in Hegel's case, it's going through the labor of the concept, right? Yeah. And Hegel is a culmination, whereas Heidegger is still working through, yeah. you know, the process of Western metaphysics. Derrida still working through on the edge of Hegel. Mm-hmm. So to me, they both, Hegel and Derrida, I mean, excuse me, Derrida and Heidegger are both working off the Hegelian system in different ways, right? And give us both very rich conceptual resources and non-conceptual resources to deal with this. Mm-hmm. Because conceptualization for Derrida is not the final, you know, moment, whereas for Hegel it is. The patient of the concept of the absolute idea that unfolds in spirit, right? Mm-hmm. Narrative, right? And, and, uh, and, and in Heidegger, of course, the positive destruction of the Western you know, metaphysical tradition and the rewriting of ontology, mm-hmm. the rewriting of being, and that whole question. So that's, that's another thing going on. Okay, so the long march of, of consciousness, this is going through the preface, just through eight points that I kind of came up with. And then uh-huh. we'll, we'll go to the text. Long itself. March of the Preface. What's that? It's like the long, long March, march through the preface. the preface. Okay. Philosophical language for Hegel is always dynamic. Keep that in mind. It's always dynamic. It's always moving, if you will. There's very little static. I wouldn't get fixed in the text. Even if you get confused, I would go with it, right? Yeah. Relinquish being in control. You know, let it, let it overtake you, right? <laughs> let it overwhelm you. Like uh, Ferenzi's, uh, or who was it? Was it Grodick that came up with the oceanic feeling? I think it was the priest, and then Roy took that up. <laughs> it was one of his religion. friends, I think. Hans, uh, right? the, the, the Oscar Pfister, mm-hmm. uh, the priest, the Swiss uh, uh, pastor. The oceanic feeling that you feel so overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. You know, and then, you know, uh, Ferenzi wrote uh, Thalassa. Of the sea, the ancient sea, you know, which plays out in the Darts movie, The uh, Weekend, which is Weekend a good chant. That's a good movie. Yes. So, okay, so the long march of consciousness. 
Okay, number one, maybe I should put this on the board for you. From the consciousness of sense data, the out there seemingly giving immediately, right? Consciousness of self, sense data. Let me put it on here. Okay, so first, right? From consciousness of sense data. Right? The out there, the exterior, if you will, right? It is seemingly, and I emphasize seemingly, given immediately. To consciousness, or you see us forever, consciousness of things, manifestly, or manifesting, I'm sorry, Manifesting themselves sensibly. So, Josh, since you've read some Kant, the sensibility and the understanding are going on here, but primarily the sensibility, mm -hmm. right? Vis a vis the Kantian system. The sense that and the out there and the seemingly given immediately, the givens of sense experience, sensory data, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Number one. Seemingly out there, you know, and seemingly immediate to us. Immediacy. Two, the consciousness of things manifesting themselves sensibly. Then, thirdly, to supra sensible reality out there. Again, exteriorization. Right, which explain the appearances of the sensible. And this is the whole thing of being and God in the preface, in the predicate. Fourthly, awareness. Themselves, right? And the activity of consciousness. So again, the dynamism, if you will, right? The activity of consciousness. You become aware that these things, right, that are appearing, is actually being constituted, right, in the activity of consciousness. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Then you become. Aware or, or you, you realize, right? I'm sorry, you realize that the activity 
of consciousness is awareness itself. To the awareness is better put. To the awareness that the autonomy, this is where people really go wrong in the United States, the autonomy of consciousness cannot be safeguarded. This is the relinquishing right. Mm -hmm. If it is only individual. This is an attack on individualism, you know, which is interesting. So if you go over these up to six, and I've got two more. The consciousness of self data, this is immediacy of things, immediate sense data. Then consciousness of the thing that manifests themselves sensibly. You get a consciousness and you begin to have a consciousness of the things, right? that are manifesting themselves. The supersensible reality out there, there must be something out there that's going on, the exteriorization that explains the appearances of the self, the sensible, mm -hmm. how they take shape, right? Then awareness that the appearing is constituting itself in the activity of actual consciousness, in the experience of consciousness. Then to realize the activity of consciousness is awareness, right, itself. It's awareness, right? Or, you know, um, and then true awareness, or that the awareness, to the awareness, that the autonomy of consciousness cannot be safeguarded if it's only individual, right? And then, inadequacy, of such consciousness unless the content itself is absolute. So going back to the narrative from the standpoint of the absolute knowing, right, the omniscient narrator in all of this, you must have this too, the content must be absolute or it's inadequate, right, in a way, right? So it, it is concretely and not absolutely, uh, not uh, uh, abstractly universal, and it becomes absolute spirit. So the geist is playing out here, right? So this is another thing too, we have not really gotten to the concrete yet, right? Because, you know, you don't, we're in the abstract universal still when we talk about religion when we talk about God, when we talk about these things, always the abstract. Revolution, in a certain way, is an abstract, you know, the, the calling, you know, is, <laughs> yeah, anyway, <laughs> is, the, is, is absolute, right? So absolute spirit, right? Do you, you kind of understand this? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, yeah, sort of, or, you know, I'll go back over it. And then finally, right, to the only form uh, which is, you know, uh, adequate to content, the only form adequate to content. And this is going on throughout the preface. This is what I'm doing here, right? Uh, which is absolute. Absolute thought. towards, or an absolute towards, the activity of absolute spirit, the activity of absolute spirit. Sorry, I don't want to mess up that thing here. Right? The Geist, knowing itself. The Geist knowing itself. So the long march takes you from the immediate sense data 
that's given to you, sense perception, right? <laughs> You're going through stages here. Sense data, sense perception, right? Super sensible of the outside, you know, the perspective <laughs> from the outside. The awareness of the appearing is really the activity of consciousness, that this consciousness is really awareness itself. If the awareness of the autonomy of consciousness is, is not the individual, right? It would be very limited there. Then the inadequacy of such consciousness, right, is happening unless there's a content or the concept is, a, is adequate. And only from the adequate to the content, the only form that's adequate to the content is the absolute, the absolute knowing, the absolute itself, but thought towards the activity of the absolute spirit. So thought and spirit, if you will, Duncan and, and uh, a geist, come together in this, in this process, in these spheres. So you maybe want to think about that spirit, spherically, as well, right? These are unfolding moments of spheres, right? You're, you're going from the immediate sense that in this room and given immediately to us, right? Then we take a step back, we see the consciousness of the things in the room, right? We begin to... These are the horizons you're talking about. Yes, 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 yes. And they become, yeah, super sensible reality, mm -hmm. you know, etc., which is the exteriorization and the awareness that the appearing is constituting itself in the activity of consciousness, and then to realize this is activity is awareness, right? Awareness itself. Okay? So this is, you know, yeah. So going back to your question about positivism, what's lacking in positivism is unawareness of its own premises, mm -hmm. of its own activity. Mm -hmm. And when Heidegger says science does not think, mm -hmm. he's really criticizing that kind of positivism mm -hmm. of science. I think that's very important to keep in mind. You know, science does not think, it does only. Mm -hmm. Right? Whereas Hegel, again, the science of the experience of consciousness is activity. Yeah. It's speculative philosophy at work, constantly, right? For Marx, it's the materialization of that speculative, speculative philosophy and putting it down. What are the categories that Marx takes from Hegel? He takes, you know, two essential categories. One, alienation and objectification, well, they're two different terms in Hegel. And then, of course, he takes contradiction, the logic of contradiction. Mm -hmm. But the dialectic is moving, moving. This is why Lenin says, you know, those who have not read Hegel's logic cannot understand capital. Well, the phenomenology may be even more dynamic. I mean, I've, I've thought about this for a long time. I'm not an expert at the logic. I've read the phenomenology multiple times. But, you know, Lenin may be wrong about that. The phenomenology is a very dynamic work. Mm -hmm. And remember, he's writing this in the heat of the German invasion. Mm. You know, the Prussian invasion. Mm. I mean, the, excuse me, the French invasion of Prussia, my, my apologies. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I was writing being in nothingness invertedly <laughs> on when the, during Vichy, during mm. the German invasion, which is kind of interesting yes, when you begin to frame these things. Cogette is writing it during the formation of the underground. So he has his presence in many ways, right? Okay, so you want to go to the, the text? I don't know, I hope this helped. I mean, you know, does, in terms does, of, does. you know, giving you, a, a, you know, some, some kind of working uh, notes to, to, to deal with here, you know, and seeing it both as a sketch and also as a, a series of, of consciousness, you know, and as, as Josh mentioned, again, moments of the horizon, you know, these kind of mm -hmm. you know, horizontal thinking, right? Yeah. So, anyway, I know we had gone, you know, through some of the propositions last time, but uh, you want to start on 42 about uh, the mathematical truths? Is that a good, good, good starting point? Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think I reread a lot of them from last week. I'm not sure how far we got. I forget. Yeah. But I did really like this time around the true and, the true and false notions. Like, uh, on, on number 39? 39, 39 yeah. yeah. Okay. Just because... Um, I don't know, for some reason it just made things really clear this time around. Okay, good. All right. Well, why don't you explain this to us then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, well, the no, dogmatism, this, you know, he's critiquing dogmatism as well. I think what I was paying a particular yeah. attention to okay. is uh, just because the subject-object sort of on my mind, 
Yeah. Uh, was He says, just as to talk of the unity of subject and object, of finite and infinite, of being and thought, etc., is inept, since object and subject, etc., signify what they are outside their unity. And since in their unity, they are not meant to be what their expression says they are. Right. Just so the false is no longer called false, a moment of truth. So it's just interesting how, you know, uh, you know, there is no, there is, there's always this moment of falsity, but it's, but it's also not false. Like uh, it's, it's the, it's the outside, right? Um, that, that for some reason struck me. I guess maybe reading Adorno or something. Yes. You know. Well, he works with this section yeah. very, very carefully. Yeah. For those of you who want to uh, look at this, you can begin to see this obviously in the negative dialectics, mm -hmm. and then you can also see this in his later work where he talks about, you know, the partial, yeah. the pars totalitas relation. It's not the whole that is the true. The whole, you know, the whole is the false, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, exactly, what we were talking about last time. Versus. So you can take section, just one way of reading this, you can take section 39 and you can go back to the famous, uh, you know, section in which he talks about the truth is the whole. Right. I guess that's where right. we spend our time. Well, just just the you know the thing, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, he goes through truth and falsity as early, and this is another thing about Hegel. You're always in this retrospective, prospective reading. Mm -hmm. you know, you're always having to hold what you've read, you know, to go forward, right, uh, right. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, uh, you know, we can go over what philosophy is which is another aspect of this, and a very crucial aspect. But uh, he goes through with the truth, truth as a whole, I think is in, um, in uh, yeah. It, I feel like it's really hard to pick out, like the, specifically where the ideas are. I tried to no make notes of it, but there's so many notes that... Well, number 20 in the preface, page 11, and at least this edition, the true is the whole. Yeah, yeah. But the whole is nothing other That's what than the on. essence consummating itself through its development. Of the absolute, it must be said that it is essentially a result. That only in the end is it what it truly is. And that precisely in this cons consists its nature. That is to be actual, to be subject, the spontaneous becoming of itself. Though it may seem contradictory that the absolute should be conceived essentially as a result, mm -hmm. it needs little pondering to set this show of contradiction in its true light. The beginning, the principle, or the absolute, as at first immediately enunciated, is only the universal. Right? Just when I say all animals, this expression cannot pass for a zoology, so it's equally plain that the words, the divine, the absolute, the eternal, do not express what is contained in them. And only such words, in fact, do express the intuition as something immediate. And going back to the immediacy of sensory, you know, sense data, etc. Right? Whatever is more than such a word, even the transition to a mere proposition, contains a becoming other that has to be taken back or is a mediation. But it is just this that is rejected with horror, as if absolute knowing were being surrendered when more is made of mediation than in simply saying that it is nothing absolute and is completely absent in the absolute. Okay? This is a very crucial section mm -hmm. to both the, the Frankfurt School and then going back to number 38, which you just read, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's also, uh, you know, a, a correlative, if you will, 39, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let me just read one part since I brought up this whole thing of speculative philosophy. Mm -hmm. Number 37. Um, let, let's look at 37 for a minute. The disparity. I mean, 36 is important. Let's, let's look at 36 through 37. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You're going to read the whole book. The I mean, whole thing is important. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're destined to do this. Yeah, right. But, the immediate existence of spirit, Geist, consciousness, 
contains the two moments of knowing and the objectivity negative to knowing. Mm -hmm. So negativity is important in, in knowledge, in knowledge production. So that when people like Aronowitz will say, he doesn't know anything, it means that they've not been through the labor of the narrative mm -hmm. to understand what the objectivity really is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we see this in meetings in the university all the time. They don't know what they're talking about. It's a problem, you know, to the educated mind. You know, we're dealing with a bunch of fools that are running things. It's very, very sad, but that's, that's the way it's become. So, since it is in this element of consciousness, the spirit develops itself and explicates its moments. These moments contain that antithesis, and they all appear as shapes of consciousness. And we're going to go back to this gestalt, right? Forms of consciousness that plays out. The shapes of consciousness, and the three major ones, of course, are skepticism, stoicism, and the unhappy consciousness. Right? We're going to go through those traditions. The science, and you notice he capitalizes Wissenschaften mm -hmm. of this pathway. And I looked in the German, I have the German, you know, at home. So I looked, he uses Wissenschaften a lot. Of this pathway is the science of the experience which consciousness goes through. So we have the long march of consciousness, the long march through the preface, like we said, <laughs> right? Okay. The substance and its movement are viewed as the object of consciousness. Consciousness knows and comprehends only what falls within its experience. For what is contained in this is nothing but spiritual substance, and this too as object of the self. But spirit becomes object because it is just this movement of becoming an other to itself, yeah. which we were talking about earlier, right? Because it is just this movement, yeah, becoming an object to itself. When I say, sometimes it's good to say, I am the object. Yeah. Right? This is very important. This goes on in Eastern philosophy, Eastern martial arts. You know, mm -hmm. I know from Tai Chi, you are the object. Right? You are the object. Right? And of suspending this otherness. And experience is the name we give to just this movement in which the immediate, the unexperienced, the abstract, whether it be of sensuous, but still unsensed being, or thought of, of uh, only thought of as simple, becomes alienated from itself and then returns to itself from this alienation and is only then revealed for the first time in its actuality and its truth, just as it has become a property of consciousness also. You'll never know unless you have processes of alienation. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to know. Yeah, this is absolutely crucial to talk about this. Yeah. This is really the birth I have marginal notes here, <laughs> you know, that are saying, this is the birth of abstract thinking, the processes of abstract thinking right here. Okay, so 37, the disparity which exists in consciousness between the I and the substance, which in, is its object, is the distinction between them, the negative in general. This can be regarded as the defect of both, though it is their soul or that which moves them. That is why some of the ancients conceived the void as the principle of motion. I think that was very interesting and say, yeah. Yes, good, huh? This is good, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For they rightly saw the moving principle as the negative. Mm -hmm. Right? Though they did not yet grasp that the negative is the self. Now, although this negative appears at first as a disparity between the eye and its object, it is just as much the disparity of the substance with itself. Thus, what seems to happen outside of it to be an activity directed against it is really its own doing, and substance shows itself to be essentially subject, capitalized subject. Hmm. When it is shown this completely, the spirit has made its existence identical with its essence. It has itself for its object, just as it is, and the abstract element of immediacy and the separating of knowing and truth is overcome. Being is then absolutely mediated. It is a substantial content, which is just as immediately the property of the eye. It is self-like, or the concept. He uses notion, but I think this is concept. With this, the phenomenology of spirit is concluded. Mm -hmm. yeah. What spirit prepares for itself in it is the element of true knowing. In this element, the moments of spirit now spread themselves out 
in that form of simplicity which knows its object as its own self. And you're talking about the subject-object here, Josh. I mean, mm -hmm. this is really one of the crucial sections. Yeah. They no longer fall apart into the antithesis of being and knowing, but remain in the simple oneness of knowing. The unity. Crucial, yeah. again, yeah. right? They are the true in the form of the true. And their difference is only the difference of content. Their movement, which organizes itself in this element into a whole, is called logic or speculative philosophy. Mm -hmm. No longer subject dominating object, yeah. as in the Cartesian moment, right? right? And it's speculative because we've achieved the unity and now we move beyond. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Absolutely. Now, because the system of experience of, of spirit embraces only the appearance of spirit, the advance from this system to the science of truth in its true shape seems to be merely negative and one might wish to be spared the negative as something false and demand to be led to a truth without more ado. Why bother with the false? Yeah, this is what I like to yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. This view, the view already discussed, namely, that we should begin with science straight away, is to be answered at this point by examining the nature of the negative in general regarded as what is false. This is a topic regarding which established ideas notably obstruct the approach to truth. It will give us an occasion to speak of mathematical knowing, which unphilosophical knowledge regards as the ideal that philosophy must strive to attain, though it has so far striven in vain. But that was interesting too. Yeah. Is that still a present people who still want to mathematize their philosophy? Yes. yes. So then he'll go on, I mean, look, you see, you're beginning to see how it works, right? I mean, now he's going to talk about the true and the false, and he's building up to dogmatism, to keep open, you know, again, one of the oppositions of speculative philosophy is certainly dogmatism, mm -hmm. whether in ordinary or in the studies, nothing else but the opinion that the true, this is number 40, 23, that the true consists in a proposition which is a fixed result, or which is immediately known. So when people say it's true, right? <laughs> you know, they're usually thinking dogmatically. To such questions, one must see so many feet of their state, a clear cut of it ought to be uh, given, right? The hypothesis, the hypothesis is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides of a right-handed triangle. But the nature of the so-called truth of that kind is the different from the nature of philosophical truths. So mathematical truth right. is different from the nature of the philosophical truth to Hegel, right? Then historical truths. Remember, we went through this a little bit last time, the historical yes. method, the mathematical. Remember, I outlined this a little bit mm -hmm. uh, last time. And, okay, so as regards historical truths, to mention them br briefly, it will be readily granted that so far, as their purely historical aspect is considered, they are concerned with a particular existence with the contingent and arbitrary aspects of a given content that have no necessity. But even such plain truths as those illustrated are not without the movement of self-consciousness. To cognize one of them, a good deal of comparison is called for. Books must be consulted some way or another. Inquiry has to be get made. Even an immediate intuition is held to have genuine value only when it's cognized as a fact along with its reasons, although it will be probably only the bare result that we're supposed to be concerned about. So now he goes into this whole thing about mathematical truths, right? Mm -hmm. And mathematical knowing, right? And this takes you up to 47, where he begins with philosophy, on the other hand. Number 47 is philosophy on the other hand. So, yeah. What do you think about his critique of uh, the mathematical, ultimately, uh, in terms of you know contemporary philosophy, people, value, for instance? Well, I mean, Badiou is a well, plain, plain uh, materialist, which is a contradiction in terms. However, <laughs> you know, this is where he's going. He really wants to materialize Plato, and where he sees in Plato is the you know he's working on the divided line. He's working mm -hmm. on the line of the world of appearances, mm -hmm. sensory data, you know, the world of the cave, 
you know, where we see objects, we're in this third third level here, yeah. third moment with things and all of this. And he thinks that the turning into the world of abstraction takes place with numbers and mathematical cognizing, mm -hmm. right? In mm -hmm. a way. He thinks he thinks alongside Plato in this this regard. Yeah. Right, in a way. And it was been left out as the mathematical rigor and exactitude that, you know, Pythagoras leaves yeah. to Plato to, to talk about, you know, and that's a dialogue of Plato, very important dialogue. Yes, please. So would he say, like, that this kind of endless negativity is, in, at some point there is, like, this, like, certain mathematical thing that down and that we get to something, like, specific? Would it be, like, a different, like, way of thinking? Like, there wouldn't be... Is, does he have, like, a negation of that moving? Well, I mean, I think what... Uh, you're speaking of Badiou here, yeah. right? Um, I think what Badiou is influenced by, and most of the French, including Lacan, too, is they're still influ influenced by the Cartesian moment uh -huh. of universal mathesis, that the foundation of modern science is built upon universal mathesis. The, yeah. the mathematical model is still the ontology of the day. So it's a combination in my view of going back to the ancients and then forward to the beginning of modernity and thinking it through that way. And the French have a very active tradition with mathematical formalism. You know, especially through Poincaré mm -hmm. and uh, Evariste uh, Galois died at 24 in a duel, right? <laughs> you know, the cigarettes I think are named from that region or wherever is where his family was. But anyway, they have a very rich tradition of mathematics here, mm -hmm. right? So you also have, you know, going on in philosophy in the 19th century, you know, post Hegel with Frege, you know, the mathematical logic, right? Very, very important. Mm -hmm. you know, in many ways, you know? Right. Yeah. So the, the question versus Heidegger, which I find much more interesting, and I find early Lacan, up until the mathematical and through the, you know, the four concepts, and thinking otherwise, the other side of psychoanalysis, which is a Galen, it's a movement right, right. in 68, 69. Yeah. Um, um, to me, I find Lacan much more interesting in the influence of the poetic ontology mm. of the Heidegger than I do of the mathematical formalism that seemed to become the rage in France. So it's a hard question to think because mathemata in Greek, mathemata, mm -hmm. really literally means to learn learning. You learn mm -hmm. your lesson. You take a lesson. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what the mathematical means. So yes, what you're talking about in terms of do you put a limit to the infinite, right. you know, or does infinite thought, and Badiou's written a book called Infinite Thought, mm -hmm. too which is very Hegelian, is that a good infinity, ultimately, you know, that we're going to go to, very Hegelian work, yeah. So, yeah, it's an interesting question, you know, a very interesting question. I mean, some people can see beauty in the mathematical construction, you know, some, some people see this, you know. Yeah. And basically, he just, he just leaves it up to being uh, superficial, mathematics. Well, it's not philosophy. Hegel, yeah. So mathematical truth, you can get into a truth of mathematical, a varite yeah. of the mathematical, but it's not philosophical truth, right? Or and philosophical it remains on the though, surface. Right. You Just, stay, you stay, you know, right. outside. Yeah. I think he says that somewhere. Yes, yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, he does say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, accordingly, this process of knowing proceeds on the surface. Right. does not touch the thing itself, its essence or its notion, and therefore fails to comprehend it. The yes. material regarding which mathematics provides such a gratifying treasury of truth is space and a numerical unit. Space is the existence in which the notion inscribes its differences as an empty, lifeless element in which they are just as inert and lifeless. <laughs> it's a good writer. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, he goes through magnitude, he goes through the... <laughs> Infinity. I think your, your question is located, I mean, textually, mm. you know, uh, section 45, 46, mm -hmm. right? Because he talks about material regarding whether mathematics provides such a gratifying treasury of truth is space and numerical unit. Space is the existence in which the concept describes its differences as in an empty, lifeless element. Yeah. In which they are just as inert and lifeless. 
The actual is not something spatial as it is regarded in mathematics with non-actual things like the objects of mathematics, neither concrete sense intuition nor philosophy has the least concern. I think that's great. Yeah. Right? In a non-actual element like this, there's only a truth of the same sort, i.e. rigid, dead propositions. We can stop at any one of them, the next one starts afresh on its own account, mm. without the first having moved on to the next. Yeah. And without any necessary connection arousing, excuse me, ar 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 slip, <laughs> ar arising through the nature of the thing itself. Right? Further, because of this principle and an element, and herein consists the formalism of mathematical evidence, and this is what our friend both Lacan and Banjou should maybe look at, I'm sure they have, but this kind of knowing moves forward along the line of equality. I thought that was interesting, this equality notion. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And he, to him, it's almost a bad thing because you just pick any one of them up and it goes nowhere, basically. That's right. Yeah. yeah. For it is what is lifeless, since it does not move of itself, does not get as far as the distinctions of essence, as far as essential opposition or inequality, and therefore does not make the transition of one opposite into its other opposite. Mm -hmm. Right? In other words, there's no movement of the in itself and the for itself here either, right? Yeah. And, yeah, going on, right? And does not attain to qualitative imminent motion or self-movement, for it is only magnitude, right? The unessential distinction that mathematics deals with. It abstracts from the fact that it is the concept which divides space into its dimensions and determines the connections between and within them. It does not, for example, consider the relationship of line to surface. Mm -hmm. And when it compares the diameter of a circle with its circumference, it runs against, up against their incommensurability, i.e. a relationship with a concept, something infinite that eludes mathematical determination. So it never gets the, the qual, 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 quality. Uh, yes, you never get the qualitative yeah. moment, right? right? Not only does the imminent so-called, and in a way, this is a critique of positivism mm -hmm. and its use of mathematics, especially through statistical approach, data collection, mm -hmm. data mining. All of these things are being critiqued here. It's very interesting, I think. You know, I agree too. In that way, yeah. Nor does the imminent so-called pure mathematics set time qua time over against space as the second material for its consideration. Applied mathematics does indeed deal with time as well as motion and other concrete things. What is applied mathematics? I mean, he's talking about military uses, mm. weapons, right, etc., right, yeah, yeah, mm. etc. Right? So, but the synthetic propositions, that is, propositions regarding relationships determined by that concept, it takes from experience and applies it formally, formulae only on these presuppositions. The fact that the so-called proof of propositions, such as those regarding the equilibrium of the lever, or the relation of space and time in the motion of falling, are often given and accepted as proofs itself, only proves how great is the need for proof of for cognition, seeing that when nothing better is to be had, cognition values even the hollow semblance of it and obtains from it some measure of satisfaction. A critique of these proofs would be as noteworthy as it would be instructive, right? Partly in order to strip mathematics of these fine feathers, partly in order to point out its limitations and show the necessity for a different kind of knowledge. Yeah. Okay? So it goes through both magnitude, right? Equality, right? Space, numerical, unit, and then it's going to go through time would be presumed would constitute as the counterpart of space, the material of the other part of pure mathematics. It is the existent concept itself, the principle of magnitude of difference not determined by the concept and the principle of equality of life, abstract lifeless unity cannot cope with the sheer unrest of life and its absolute distinction. It is therefore only in a paralyzed form that is as the numeric lit unit that this negativity becomes the second material of mathematical cognition, which is an external activity reduces what is self-moving to mere material, so as to possess it in an indifferent, external, lifeless content. 
On the other hand, philosophy has to do not with unessential determinations, but with a determination insofar as it is essential. Its element and content is not the abstract or the non-actual, but the actual, that which posits itself and is alive within itself, existence with its own notion. So in a way, Hegel's the first philosopher of everyday life, right here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons Lefebvre writes a book on Hegel, Marx, and Nietzsche, right? As our working triad, which Josh very much put up without knowing Lefebvre, but it's got a good positive unconscious there in terms of the, uh, the figures in this, in this course. I've read uh, his book on dialectics. And yeah. I've read Rhythm Analysis. Yeah, right. And I read uh, in Stanley's class, I think we did some... Critique uh, of Everyday Life. Of Everyday Life, yeah. Right. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the modern world. But yeah, Lefebvre is pretty good. I like yeah. that. And you see appearance here, down here. I have an underline in my own text here. 47, about 10 lines down. Appearance is the arising and passing away that does not itself arise and pass away, but is in itself. It subsists intrinsically. You begin to see the in itself and the for itself movement and constitutes the actuality and the movement of the life of truth. And this is beautiful. The true is thus the Bacchanalian revel in which no member is not drunk, yet because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. Judged in the court of this movement, the shingle shapes of spirit do not persist any more than determined thoughts do. But there is just as much positive and necessary moments as there are negative and evanescence. It is the whole of the movement seen as a state of repose what distinguishes itself therein and gives itself particular existence preserved as something that recollects itself whose existence is self-knowledge and whose self-knowledge is just as is immediately existence. Talking about Platonic theories of recollection here, active recollection, in a way, mm-hmm. and know thyself. Right? Yeah. Then he talks about the method of the movement, right? And ma- mathematics and its movements, it goes back to mathematics in 48, that are quite old fashioned explanations, divisions, axioms, sets of theorems, proof principles, deductions, and conclusions. Right? Exactly. For Hegel, this is not movement, right? These are fixed points, right? Not part of the dynamic. Okay. So then he goes on to the triadic uh, form, uh, which is, yeah, we're going to have to go pretty soon. The triadic form developed by instinct, but in his work, still lifeless and uncomprehended. So the next thing will be the triadic movement, and he'll go through, you know, understanding, right? If you look at 51, the inner life and self-movement, kind of simple determinist of intuition, which here means sense knowledge as a construction. And he looks at understanding, teaches that the understanding is electricity, the animal is nitrogen, or the equivalent of the south and north pole, whether this is expected as badly as here, or concocted with more terminology, and confronted with such a power which brings together things that appear to lie far apart and with the violence suffered by the passive things of sense through such association and imparts to them the concept of semblance but saves itself of doing the main thing, expressing the concept itself or the meaning of the sensuous representation. Confronted with all this, the untutored mind may be filled with admiration and astonishment and may venerate it in the profound work of genius. And, and this, again, is a kind of critique, if you will, of, or a critique, really, of Schelling's intellectual intuition, his friend Schelling. Yeah, many might the historical. So Hegel's also operating on the historical level, argument, arguing with Fichte and Schelling throughout this. OK, so. Um, I don't know if you read through it all. I think for next time we should, uh, you know, go on. I mean, maybe go over the introduction quickly. And if you don't mind, maybe you can start looking at sense certainty, which begins the this and that of meaning, right? We'll talk about sense and meaning. If you can get through that, that'd be great. Maybe into perception, 
Maybe if you can get that far. I don't know. If, if not, we can, well, we'll have plenty to do with uh, the remainder of, of the preface and uh, the introduction. <laughs> right? Now, Jean Hippoli, I think I mentioned this the first class, always suggested read the introduction first. We're reading the preface first. Right? Mm -hmm. We're reading retrospectively what he's doing so that you can see the internal you know, movement of the text going forward. Okay? And what I'll do um, over the you know, next week is I'll, I'll figure out a reading strategy to get through this as much as we can, right? Because I do want to go on to the Dedi Da, and I want to go on to some of the poetic reactions to, to Hegel. So I figure we have next week, which is the 20, um, um, the 19th, I think it is, right? Then the 26th is the week of Thanksgiving, right? Then December, we have three sessions in December. If we need more, we can always do, you know, after January um, is, is fine with me, yeah. So, okay? Sounds good. So that's good, okay, good. I thought I we guess did a lot. I guess it is later anyway. What's that? Yeah, we did a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.